Okay. Hello, everyone. Is this, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, this is just like the good old days. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about uh, what happened. My wife is, is doing much better now, but I just, like, I didn't feel good being so far away this afternoon, so I decided to stay here. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for putting up with this. Not beyond each other. <laughs> thank you. That's <laughs> for putting up with this. Um, okay, so um, I am going to first talk about the theological political treatise stuff and then about the uh the main reading that i was supposed to discuss on monday and then as i explained my email the other next week monday will be what should have been today and then wednesday will be what should have been monday and then there's going to be a special lecture on thursday again by zoom and that will get us back on track. Um, okay. So, um, theological political treatise. So there's basically, so there's, there's two different questions um, about the Bible that Spinoza is considering together. Um, but that he ultimately, his point is to separate them, right? So one is, now let's see, is this on the screen? Yes. What does the Bible mean, right? Like, how should we interpret it? And the second question is, how do we know? And then you can say in parentheses, whether it's true. Right, I mean, the reason I put the weather in parentheses is that, of course, uh, most of Spinoza's predecessors who discussed this question are discussing the question, how do we know it's true? <laughs> of course, it's true. The question is, how do we know it's true? Spinoza, as it turns out, is actually discussing the question, how do we know whether it's true? <laughs> right. Um, so he discusses four types of answer to the first question, um, other than his own answer. Um, this is towards the end of the reading. So it's, it's in the reading from the theological political treatise for today. Um, and Right, the first answer, so this is basically the Protestant answer. How do we know what the Bible means? By a supernatural faculty, right? That is only those who are among the elect and read the Bible with faith will get the right sense out of it and the others won't, something like that. Um, that's one answer. Another answer is so these by the, these are answers to to question number one. I mean that is their answers to how we uh, how we should approach question number one, right? Like how do we how can we tell what the Bible means? So one is supernatural faculty. Another is tradition, and this is basically the Jewish answer as Spinoza portrays it. Um, that is the ordinary, like, rabbinic Jewish answer, because he's going to discuss Maimonides separately. 
right? And so the answer is the 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 how do we interpret the Bible? This answer is well, you know, we have a direct chain of transmission from uh, Moses and the other prophets down to our time that tells us how to interpret it. So if you want to know what it means, you have to consult that tradition. Um, so another answer is we have an infallible interpreter, right? This is the Catholic answer. The Pope, however the Pope inter interprets the Bible is the right way to interpret the Bible. So if you want to know how to understand it, ask the Pope, because he's guaranteed to be right. And then finally, we have Maimonides' answer. Right, so once again, Maimonides is, uh, you know, the um, most famous, most important medieval Jewish philosopher. Um, and uh, there's many things in Spinoza are, the Spinoza is clearly very familiar with Maimonides. Um, many things in Spinoza seem to be, um, there are many things that he seems to agree with Maimonides about. I guess I'll put it that way. But then, of course, there's, well, I shouldn't say of course. They're both tricky people, and it's hard to be sure what they really believe, both Spinoza and Maimonides. <laughs> right? yeah. But at least uh, apparently, then there's also some super important things they disagree about. And this is one of them, right? Um, so, um, so this answer is, well, um, if you want to know what the biblical text means, use your reason to figure out what's true. <laughs> um, and the biblical text must be consistent with that. So you can use that to understand it. Right, so he um, he quotes, uh, I think, what he takes to be kind of a smoking gun, where Maimonides admits exactly how far he'd be willing to take this principle. Um, whether that's exactly fair to Maimonides or not, it's a little bit complicated because maybe I shouldn't go to this yet. I'll just say that in addition to being an interpreter of the Bible, Maimonides is also an interpreter of Aristotle. He's an Aristotelian. Um, and remember what we saw that meant. Uh, you know, it means you you try to interpret Aristotle to mean what you think is true. That is, he's interpreting Aristotle the same way he's interpreting the Bible. Um, and in the, I mean, he doesn't make as big a deal about that, but I think it's clear that Maimonides understands perfectly that the, the, that both of these texts have a similar problems of interpretation. And in the exact case that, that Spinoza is talking about, you know, um, about the eternity of the world, Aristotle, on any normal reading of Aristotle, proves that the world is eternal, right? That it didn't have a beginning in time. It's always existed. So Maimonides, like, uh, interprets Aristotle in a very strange way in order to make him mean that that could be true, but it might not be true, basically. <laughs> right? So that is, on Maimonides' interpretation of Aristotle, Aristotle himself doesn't claim he has a proof. And then Maimonides goes back and says, and so therefore we're not required to reinterpret the Bible here. 
but uh, what's actually happened is much more complicated. All right, anyway, that's, I mean, and Spinoza being the clever, tricky person he is, quite likely uh, has noticed all of that, but is, but is for his own purposes, is taking Maimonides in a simpler way than maybe you should. But okay, so anyway, back to the, back to the smoking gun quote. So, and this is a little bit hard to understand, both because, uh, I mean, it's a translation. Presumably, he's translating from the Hebrew, the medieval Hebrew translation. My Maimonides' book that in English is known as the Guide to the Guide to the Perplexed uh, was written in Arabic, but in, but in Maimonides' own lifetime, it was translated into Hebrew. And Spinoza is translating into Latin, or perhaps he's translating the medieval Latin translation, which was also made from the Hebrew. So in any case, um, that's one reason it's hard to understand. The other reason is that the translator here has chosen to uh, translate Maimonides into kind of biblical English, so to speak. I guess to give you the feeling that this is this is a more medieval Latin than Spinoza's, although I'm not even sure that's really true. Spinoza Latin is not very modern, I don't think. But in any case, yeah, as it may, so so uh, but so let me just explain what Maimonides is saying here in the quote. Know that we shrink not from affirming that the world hath existed from eternity because of what scripture saith concerning the world's creation. Right, so Maimonides is saying, um, how do I get this in the books? Maimonides is saying, um, uh, I don't affirm that the world is eternal, eternal, right? That is, I, I do shrink from affirming that the world is eternal but not because the Bible says that it was created in time. For the texts which teach that the world was created are not more in number than those which teach that God hath a body. Right, so Maimonides is saying, yeah, it, and the literal understanding, this, by the way, as I mentioned before, is far from clear, but in any case, on a literal understanding of the first chapter of Genesis, God created the world from nothing at a certain time. Um, he says, that's true. Um, and there's other texts that seem to suggest the same thing. But there's also lots of texts that seem to suggest that God has a body. Describes God as having an arm, an outstretched arm, you know, uh, right, walking in paradise, someone just mentioned. Um, so, uh, Maimonides says, uh, and of course, you know, we don't interpret those to mean that God really has a body. <laughs> Obviously, you know that we reinterpret those because we know that God for sure doesn't have a body because we can prove that by philosophy, right? And I mean, the proof is along the lines of the proofs that Spinoza was uh, arguing against in the ethics, right? Where you say, well, every body is finite, and therefore God can't be a body. And Spinoza says, well, the finite modes of extension are finite, you know, whatever. Anyway, but so we can prove by philosophy that God doesn't have a body. And so, uh, uh, Therefore, we reinterpret those biblical passages that seem to say that God had, does have a body. Um, and neither are the approaches in this matter of the world's creation closed or even made hard to us, right? That is, uh, we, there's nothing preventing us from doing the same thing here that we do in the, in the God has a body case. So that, we should, so that we should not be able to explain what is written as we did when we showed that God has no body. Nay, peradventure, <laughs> we can explain and make fast the doctrine of the world's etern eternity more easily than we did away with the doctrine, the, the doctrines that God hath of the yatified body. Right. 
Yet two things hinder me from doing as I have said and believing that the world is eternal. As it hath been clearly shown that God hath not a body, we must perforce explain all those passages whereof the literal sense agreeeth not with the demonstration, for sure it is that they can be so explained. But the eternity of the world had not hath not been so demonstrated, right? So this, as I said, is Maimonides reinterpretation of Aristotle to say that what looks like his demonstration of the eternity of the world is not really a demonstration, right? So the eternity of the world hath not been demonstrated, meaning Aristotle didn't really demonstrate it and didn't claim to demonstrate it, right? He's not saying Aristotle is wrong. He's saying Aristotle didn't even claim to demonstrate it. Therefore, it is not necessary to do violence to scripture in support of some common opinion, whereof we might, at the bidding of reason, embrace the contrary. Right, so um, this is, Spinoza says, this is, you know, this shows that Maimonides will do whatever it takes to make the Bible agree with what he thinks is true. Um, so that's this fourth method of interpretation. Now, um, notice that any of these answers to the first question automatically give you a great answer to the second question, right? So like if we understand the Bible by a supernatural faculty given to us by God. Well, obviously, whatever that reveals is going to be true, right? Um, if, uh, if you assume this tradition thing, I mean, it's important that, it, that it's known to start with Moses and the prophets, right? It's not just it goes back to some really good interpreter once. It goes back to someone who had a direct revelation as to what the text means, right? So again, if this answer is right in terms of how to interpret the text, you also can be sure that the text, uh, what the text says under that interpretation is true. Because it comes from God, right? God is not a deceiver. <laughs> um, similarly for this one, right? Like if there's a divinely authorized infallible interpreter, then, um, uh, uh, obviously, they're not going to find some interpretation of the Bible according to which it's false. And this, right, explicitly, the whole procedure is to first determine what's true and then interpret the Bible to mean that. <laughs> right. So for all of these, you know, uh, these not only tell you what the Bible means, but they also tell you how you can know whether it's true, and they I, they tell you how you can know that it is, that it is true. Um, so Spinoza rejects all four of these. Um, I mean, the way he rejects them is is... It's pretty, it, it, in a way, like, it's not, it's not really subtle arguments. It's, it's pretty glaring problems, basically, <laughs> right? In other words, like, so in this one, he says, well, I've looked at the commentaries written by these people who supposedly had a supernatural faculty, and they look like they're just as human as everyone else. <laughs> so I don't see any evidence of the supernatural faculty. <laughs> Right, like they're working just as hard to, you know, uh, to understand the text as everyone else. Um, <laughs> this one, he says, uh, well, uh, this tradition isn't really reliable. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, rather than go into a lot of details as to how we know it's not reliable, he just points out that, you know, so there's a a uh, famous rabbinic text that lists the, the chain of transmission. And basically their chronology is way off. The rabbinic chronology in general, for some reason, kind of like collapses the Persian period. So like between the 
return from the Babylonian exile and the like beginning of the Hellenistic period was a long period in, of rule by the Persian Empire and they kind of collapsed that. And so, you know, like Spinoza says, um, look, they, you know, they only have the right number of generations, basically. <laughs> this can't possibly be reliable. <laughs> um, this one, he says, you know, well, first of all, uh, like a similar thing, how do we know that the Pope is supposed to be infallible? I mean, that the Pope says that he's infallible, but uh, the, like other people who also were around at the same time that papacy started don't think he's infallible and like who should we trust but moreover he has an even stronger and maybe more interesting argument which is that he says um so remember he argued that the, the re actually religious content of the bible is only its ethical precepts They're directed at individuals to tell them how to live, you know, honest and simple, or I forget exactly how he puts it, but um, how to live good lives. And he says, that's not the kind of thing that you need an authorized interpreter of. You need an authorized interpreter of, you know, a, a legal system of a state. Right, because someone has to settle the disputes in the end. Like in our system, it's the Supreme Court. And Spinoza says, uh, based on something it says in the Bible, that in you know it, it used to be the high priest. Um, but he says, uh, you know, uh, there's no need for any institution like that when it comes to precepts of ethics, which everyone should be able to understand for themselves. So in other words, we don't even expect an infallible interpreter in this case. It's not necessary. Um, and then finally, as to this one, he says, um, and this is the um, most interesting one, I think, from the point of view of, so like, Remember, in the background of, of everything else that's going on in this course, I'm, you know, I'm always thinking about the um, how these philosophers think about the authority of tradition and of texts. Um, so, and and this is in rejecting this opinion, Spinoza is, I think, um, in an even more radical way than Descartes trying to um, completely eliminate that as a source of knowledge. Because he says, look, this is no way to interpret a text. And again, you know, he's talking about Maimonides interpreting the Bible, but he could be talking about Maimonides interpreting Aristotle. This is no way to interpret a text. First, figure out what it means. Then you can decide whether it's true, <laughs> right? Um, so, like, having rejected all of these, Spinoza gives his own answer to one, which is not going to give any kind of answer to two, or at least not any kind of positive answer to two. Right, so that's why I say that this is cutting off the possibility of um, relying on the authority of a text in some way. Um, because now the way he's saying, the way you have to interpret the text, and he goes into a lot of detail, um, you know, most of this, as he well knows, is not really possible to do very well with the biblical text. And therefore, I think he thinks the conclusion is we don't understand very well what it means, right? Because he says, well, what you have to do is investigate the history of the text. You have to know... Um, the language was written in really well. Uh, um, um, you have to know the who the authors were and like uh, how they were educated and what their opinions were and what audiences they were speaking to. You have to know that 
the means by which the text reached you, whether it could have been corrupted in between, et cetera, et cetera, right? And for all those things in the case of the Bible, our information is limited, <laughs> right? Like we don't basically have any other text in biblical Hebrew except the Bible. There's like a few, I don't know, Ostracons or something that they just have like a few words on them. But basically, it's just the Bible, right? So, um, uh, you know, information about the authors, where they lived, whatever, well, you know, whatever you can kind of get out of the text, if you can believe it. Uh, <laughs> um, it's so, but, but basically Spinoza says, like, as far as you can do these things, and these are basically the tools of modern scholarship, right? Of modern textual scholarship, as, as opposed to postmodern, I guess. Um, right? Like, if you want to understand a text, find out everything that you can about when it was written, who it was written by, the language it was written in, how it was translated, whatever, and uh, put all those things together, get your get best guess to what it means. And then if you're interested in whether it's true or not, you have to have some other way of figuring out what's true and compare them. <laughs> okay, so 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 that's Spinoza's answer. And um, I guess the I think I alluded to this before when I first talked about the theological political treatise, that um, it's not entirely clear that Spinoza himself really does this when he interprets the Bible, or that he even really thinks it's a good idea. Um, because, you know, so because it, it so happens that he's able to find what he thinks are the correct ethical precepts in the Bible, including things like religious toleration and democracy or whatever, right? So like uh, um, things that are not such a great fit <laughs> to the biblical text. Um, and uh, it seems like, I guess you could say that perhaps um, Well, I mean, to um, to mention a distinction that Spinoza himself mentions in the case of Moses, right? He says, you know, he, he goes through this thing about, should we take Moses literally when he says God's, God is jealous? And he says, uh, well, um, unlike in the case of God as a fire, where we can point to other texts, in the Bible itself that that seem to indicate that God is not a body. Uh, in the case of, um, of God is jealous, all the texts go the same way. They all describe God as having emotions and whatever. And he says, and therefore we should conclude that Moses believed that, or at least that he wished, wished to teach that. <laughs> right? Like we can't be sure that, that Moses actually believed it. Oh, we can be sure that he wished to tell people that. Um, and there may be something like that, and, and that may that particular passage may be a signal to pay attention, right? There may be something like that going on in Spinoza where you're like um, a certain audience is supposed to uh who like can't separate themselves from, still can't separate themselves from the authority of the Bible, is supposed to swallow his interpretation of the Bible as telling them to be ethical. And maybe another, a certain other audience is supposed to say, oh, wow, that's not what it really means. But it's a good thing to tell people that, right? Something like that. I, I mean, as I said, Spinoza is tricky. Uh, um, and, um, some people want to interpret all philosophers this way. I think, uh, you know, I think it depends which one, but Spinoza definitely, and Maimonides, definitely have to pay attention to the question of whether 
they're always saying things that they really take them true. Um, okay, so that with that, I'm done with talking about the theological political treatise. Are there questions about that before I go on? Oh, someone said, I thought Protestants were all about sola scriptura. That's true, and and uh, Josephine said that. And yes, it does say Protestant in A. That, that's true, and Spinoza is trying to connect to, like, um, um, Like I said, when the chapter starts, it sounds like he's, it sounds like a fundamentalist critique of human comedy okay? and how it's sacrilegious and people, you know, um, and so, and, and yeah, as he goes on, he continues to say, to say things that make it sound like he's a radical Protestant. This is, we should only interpret the Bible using the Bible itself. Um, but, um, uh, but, I think uh, ultimately what he means by that and what they mean by that are completely different. And what they mean by it is this. <laughs> and what he might, means by it is modern biblical criticism. Um, and again, you can you can see the difference because sola scriptura doesn't mean like just look at the Bible by itself and then reach your own conclusion about whether it's true or not. <laughs> hey, that's certainly not what it's supposed to mean, but that is what Spinoza means. All right. Yes. So, um, does he talk at all about like um, additions to the Bible, like politically motivated additions? Because, I mean, obviously not in Judaism, but um, in uh, what's it? in Catholicism, right? Like what um, books became part of the New Testament was a, a political decision, right? Well, that was true in Judaism, too. I don't know why you say obviously not in Judaism. I mean, someone had to decide which books counted, right? I and, guess. I don't know about Judaism. Yeah. That's what I'll say. Yeah. Um, I mean, we don't know very much, I think, about that process. It, obviously, it had a big influence on the, the Christian process as well, right? Because for the most part, except for the Apocrypha, <laughs> uh, uh, it's the same list, right? So, uh, but yeah, I mean, there are some, there are some records of debates of, you know, rabbis who wanted to say that certain texts didn't count as like biblical, or like the Song of Songs or whatever. Um, and there are also are certain places, a few places in rabbinic literature where they quote um, ben Sira, which is not part of the Hebrew Bible, but is part of the Apocrypha. <laughs> um, so, yeah, at some point that decision had to be made. Uh, I mean, it's certainly political in the sense that it had to be made, like, had to. I mean, but if you wanted to have religion, as we understand it, as a human institution, Right, that someone had to be authorized to make that decision for everyone, someone or some group or some process, right? Um, or at least after the fact that it had to be accepted. So in that sense, it had to be political. If you say it's politically motivated in the sense that someone wanted a certain book added in order to get power for themselves or something like that, I'm not sure if that's clear, but of course it could, could be true. Um, 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 yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. Um, no, it's fine, but I just did Spinoza. Do you know what he would have thought about that? What things get put into the Bible? I mean, he mentions that, right? That's the last thing he mentions on his list of, of the history of the text. Um, but yeah, I don't remember or know what, you know, remember whether he talks more in detail about that anywhere else. But 
Um, I think, look, you can assume he thinks that humans did it for human reasons. Uh, um, and so I guess, like, getting back to the last thing I was talking about, let's suppose other books had been adopted and said, which, you know, um, so suppose other books that that are like more flagrantly contradictory to Spinoza's ethical precepts have been accepted. I'm not even sure if that's possible. So it's <laughs> so flagrantly opposed. But you know, like would Spinoza have said, oh no, now we have to give up on this Bible thing, right? It's it's not divine, it doesn't contain pure ethical precepts. Or would he have still said Fortunately, the Bible contains these true ethical precepts that we can verify by our reason. <laughs> um, uh, so if it's the latter, then then again, then like in effect, at least publicly, he's doing what Maimonides does. That is what Maimonides does publicly. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. If you have any, yeah. is there anything else you wanted to ask about that? Yeah. Yeah, Josephine mentioned something about the Samaritans. Um, so I that was a good example. Um, okay, so if uh, if we're done with that now, I'm going to go on to uh, the ethics reading. So, um, so the main theme of the reading from the ethics for today is the problem of, well, I guess, again, as in Descartes, you could say it's the problem of evil. But where evil means error. Because what other kind of evil can there be in thought? <laughs> um, so, so, so this stuff basically corresponds to the things in the fourth and the sixth meditation. Um, but it's worth starting with an argument from the third meditation and um, uh, here. third meditation it's page 95 in the text um So I'll switch back to the document. Right, so again, this is back to Descartes, the third meditation. But perhaps I am something greater than I myself understand. And all the perfections which I attribute to God are somehow in me potentially, though not yet um, emerging or actualized. And, um, right, this is supposed to be so, like, at this point in the third meditation, the meditator is trying to prove that. Um, I myself am not God, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what's going on here. <clears throat> and this is an objection. 
right? Like maybe I don't, I'm not an imperfect thing that needs something else to account for my existence. Maybe I have all the infinite perfections that I attribute to God, but it just in me potentially, and I don't have them yet. And the meditator answers, um, um, this is all quite irrelevant to the idea of God, which contains nothing that is potential. Indeed, this gradual increase in knowledge is itself the surest sign of imperfection. <laughs> right? So the answer is that having uh, all perfections, even all of them potentially, is nothing like having them all actually the way God does. Um, And then, actually, I guess I should say one more, I should read one more thing, um, which is at the bottom of the same page. Um, yet if I derive my existence from myself, then I should neither doubt nor want nor lack anything at all. Right, that is, uh, God wouldn't deceive himself. Um, so, like, if I really had all these perfections, I would know that I have. Um, because I would have the power to make myself know everything, and so I would, and so I wouldn't doubt. Um, and as I said, there's kind of, I didn't know if you want to count it as a premise. I think the card makes it self-evident, but that, um, of course, in that situation, I wouldn't want to deceive myself. Like I would use the power to know everything. I wouldn't like deliberately hide things from myself. So in a nutshell, Spinoza's explanation of error is um, that, first of all, right, so like, so the meditator proves that I'm not God. This is Descartes. Proves that I'm not God. Because I'm in error. And God wouldn't deceive self. God wouldn't deceive himself, let's say. Well, that's a little bit, you know. God wouldn't deceive themselves. God wouldn't deceive itself. <laughs> That'd be better. Uh, but in any case, um, um, so Spinoza starts off with the very argument that the meditator is trying to reject in part three. I, with respect to substance, I am God. Everything is. So, um, but nevertheless, regarded merely as this human mind, I'm only a finite mode of God's attribute of thought. So, um, but also not, <laughs> right? That is, I am God with respect to substance. This, I mean, remember, if you ask, like, substance is the answer to what is it, right? Like, if you ask, what is there? 
So, like, according to Aristotelian, the answer is going to be a rational animal, it's fire, it's right, it's going to be a substance. And according to Descartes, it's going to be, well, it's, it's a body or it's a mind, right? Again, it's going to be a substance. So if you ask the same question to Spinoza, the answer is always, it's God, right? So that's why I say, I am God. But on the other hand, I'm not God from another point of view. And therefore, like the very thing that the meditator is supposing, maybe I'm something greater than I understand, Spinoza says, that's it, exactly. You're something greater than you understand. <laughs> Um, so, therefore, with respect to substance, I do give myself, I do cause myself to exist, and I do give myself all possible perfections, and there's nothing potential. Nothing potential means, again, from God's point of view, so to speak. Um, subspecie aetanitatis under the form of eternity um, everything is simultaneous all the modes are simultaneous or rather they I mean they're not in time right <laughs> so um, um, so there's no like passing from something only potentially being to it actually being it's all actual but at the same time, therefore, from this point of view, um, I don't derive my existence from myself. I have, or rather actually am, according to Spinoza, only a limited finite perception, or I, oh, perfection, sorry, although you could say perception too. <laughs> All right. Um, and, uh, and, um, There are things in me that are merely potential and or merely contingent, right? That is that things that um, that might or may not be. When they are, they can they exist contingently. When they're not, they exist only potentially. Subject to what Spinoza means by contingency what he says we need to mean by it, namely that we regard something as contingent when we don't know the causes that determine it to exist or not to exist. <laughs> um, um, which from our point of view, subspecie temporis under the form of time, right, um, translates to we don't know when it exists. It, it, it sometimes it exists and other times it doesn't. Um, and, you know, in fact, like you can say, right, so in this aspect, I don't deceive myself. Oops, I'm writing that where you can't see it, I don't know. Fairly logical, maybe. All right, so in that respect, I don't deceive myself. Right, that is qua God, I give myself all um, among all the other perfections, I give myself because I cause myself to exist, right? So I give myself all the perfections in the mode of thought. Um, I give myself every possible idea, and they're all true. Um, but the way I do that, 
right? Like that is how does how does God have the ideas of finite modes, like the idea of a specific human body? Well, um, only by way of a finite mode of thought. Right, that is, if God contained only infinite modes of the attribute of thought, God wouldn't contain any ideas of particular finite bodies. So that is, so so God can only not deceive itself <laughs> about finite bodies by containing finite minds, as Spinoza understands them. Um, or anyway, by having finite minds in whatever that means, <laughs> finite minds as modes in God. Um, and those finite minds, um, because they're finite, have to be deceived. At least they have to be ignorant, but, um, but Spinoza is going to go on to show, right, that is there have to be some things they don't know or else they wouldn't be finite. Um, but Spinoza is going to go on to go go on to show when he really explains where error comes from that it's worse than that. A finite mind has to be uh, um, actively wrong, not just things it doesn't know. It has false ideas. So right. So the only way that God cannot deceive itself is by having infinitely many deceived finite minds as modes. Um, so, you know, like, so broadly speaking, uh, you know, this, despite this difference here, the, um, when, like, when you get down to the details, so far Spinoza's answer to this pro pro problem is pretty similar to Descartes. Right, like if you ask, how can it be that um, I'm a mode of an infinite thing and yet I'm deceived or I'm, you know, imperfect? Um, the answer is, uh, well, number one, evil or error is a privation, right? It just consists of the fact that I'm finite and don't have all perfections. Um, so, um, the, the perfect cause is the cause of whatever perfection I have. There is no cause of the perfections I don't have. That's nothing. Right? So again, that's the same as Descartes' answer. And furthermore, Descartes' uh, other answer, I guess it was the second answer, is perhaps I'm, I'm only a part of a whole, which is more perfect because it contains this imperfect part. Spinoza, so in, like in, in the third meditation, at that point, the meditator is kind of speculating, right? Because at that point, the meditator hasn't proved that there is anything else besides themselves and God. Oh, sorry, in the fourth meditation, sorry. the meditator hasn't proved that there is anything else besides themselves and God. But, um, but Spinoza actually proves, <laughs> right? As I just said, that he proves that the perfection of God requires just such an imperfection as as I have or as I am, right? It requires just such an imperfect mode. Um, so it's absolutely true. I'm part of something which, um, a part of a larger whole, which is more perfect because it contains an imperfect part like me. Um, so, you know, I think the only, uh the the what's left here for Spinoza to do is the same thing that's left here at, for Descartes to do at this point, which is to uh explain exactly what that means I can be deceived about and and hopefully isolate some other things that I can't be deceived about. So far we don't have that, right? There's neither uh, Maybe I shouldn't leave these up here because I'm really talking about the fourth meditation now, right? But like neither both Descartes and Spinoza
have these answers that number one, evil, I guess I should say in Descartes' terminology is pure negation. Right? It's, evil is nothing. Lack of perfection. And the second part of the answer is um, I'm part of a whole. And both of those explain how, um, well, at least how there can be things I don't know. Um, um, perhaps also, I mean, but as when Spinoza develops it farther and when Descartes develops it farther, it's gonna turn out they can explain also why um, I can be wrong about things. Um, so I guess I should say, maybe I should say there's there's two things they both have to do now. These explain why there's certain things I don't know, even though I'm uh, the effect of a perfect cause. They have to also explain, but why am I wrong? Right, this is the point at which Descartes says, okay, but ignorance is pure negation, but what about um, error? That sounds like I have a belief that's actually false. I shouldn't have that belief. I'm worse with that belief than I would be without it. So it seems like I have, I don't just lack some perfection, I have something bad, right? So this is, so both Spinoza and Descartes have to explain this. And then they also have to somehow explain, um, when can I be wrong? And how can I tell? Right, because um, again, like this would be enough if all you wanted to do was solve this puzzle. Okay, this shows you can sometimes be wrong. But if you want to also develop positive knowledge, then you better have some explanation of what are the cases where you can't be wrong and how can you know when you're dealing with a case like that? Okay, and so Bernardo asked, does this deception come from imagination? Um, uh, yes, that's that's what we'll see. But I mean, but by the time you understand what he thinks imagination is, it becomes kind of like the same thing as being deceived. <laughs> um, so. Um, So, so let me talk about this. Um, so the terms of this problem are, for Spinoza, are set. Um, and Descartes' solution to it is ruled out um, by what he says suddenly reveals near the end of part two. And this is another one of his like surprises. Um, So let's see, this is a corollary to Proposition 49, it's on page 96. Will and intellect are one and the same thing. Surprise, because up until now he's been talking about will and intellect as two different things. <laughs> but it turns out they're the same thing. Now. Um, so remember, th so, so that completely rules out Descartes' solution, which Spinoza then discusses, although not naming Descartes, but hopefully you recognize Descartes when he talked about it, right? Because Descartes' solution is 
that the will is in me is like infinite and can't be separated is, is simple and infinite can't be separated into smaller pieces so i like you either have a will or you don't um but my understanding is finite and that means i have the ability to affirm things without uh um the intellect telling me to affirm them I have ability to affirm things without justification. And therefore, I have the ability to make mistakes, to believe things that are false. But obviously, if will and intellect are one and the same thing, then that solution is off the table. Um, now, I mean, this, this statement is pretty surprising as like, what do you mean will and intellect are the same thing? Um, so I think if you pay careful attention, you'll see that, first of all, like the will, um, it's, can I put this? It turns out that Spinoza means, really means that the will and the intellect, the will in the broadest sense of the will are the same thing. But like, until you understand what he thinks the relationship between the mind and the body is, or until you take that into account, it can seem like he's really talk, thinking about the will only in a very restricted sense, namely in the, in the sense that Descartes is trying to use it in the fourth meditation, right? So the way Descartes is trying to use the will in the fourth meditation is um, that he says, you know, you can have an idea of something, um, I don't know where this picture is going to go, but <laughs> so it's like the idea of Bucephalus. So, I mean, I guess Bucephalus has objective reality in the idea, right? This is Bucephalus existing in the idea with, with, why is that out of focus? Um, Eucephalus exists in the idea with objective being. Suppose all I do is have that idea of Bucephalus. I can't be either right or wrong, right? I'm basically just thinking about Bucephalus. To get something that could be right or wrong, Descartes says, I have to add an affirmation or assertion of the idea. A judgment, um, and and at least like it seems like for Descartes, the fundamental form of judgment is just affirming that the object of an idea exists. And that Descartes says is a function of the will. So as I said, I don't know where to put this in this picture or how, but I guess you could say like. This is the intellect. And again, this is Descartes, right? You can tell this is Descartes because I'm drawing the will over here and the intellect over here, whereas Spinoza says they're one and the same thing. So Descartes says, in order to be either right or wrong, I have to like, I have to affirm or deny this idea. I have to assent to it or reject it. And what that means is that I'm like, um, if I affirm it, then I'm taking it that what has objective reality in the idea has formal reality outside.
whereas if I deny it, I'm um, I'm taking it that what has formal reality, the idea doesn't have objective reality outside. And now I could be wrong. But before that act of the will, all I had was, I was just thinking about Bucephalus. It couldn't be either right or wrong. So when Spinoza says that will and intellect are the same thing, what he means is that to have an idea is to affirm its object. Right, that is, he's, he's denying that at least if all the mind contains is that idea, then um, its object is affirmed. Um, to have an idea of something, um, is to have an idea of it as existing. Therefore, when I have the idea, I, I affirm that it exists. I mean, like, in effect, this is um, taking the kind of objection that people often make to the ontological proof. And um, rather than answering it, accepting the conclusion. <laughs> Right, like people will say, well, uh, um, it, well, actually, people will often say it this way: Couldn't you just add existence to any old idea, right? Like, so I'm going to take the idea of a pink elephant plus existence. Can I prove that it exists now because it's part of the definition? But I think they could say what Spinoza is saying: uh, Doesn't any idea? Isn't it always the idea of something that exists? That is in my idea, it exists. And, and couldn't the ontological proof therefore be able to be used to prove that whatever I think of exists? And Spinoza says yes. <laughs> uh, uh, everything con conceivable is produced. Right? Everything that can fall under the conception of, the, of an infinite intellect is produced. Every idea is an idea of that infinite intellect. So the objects of all those ideas exist. Those are all ideas of existing things. Um, and so you can't have the idea without affirming the existence of its object. Okay, I mean, and so by the way, I said uh, that it will turn out that this actually is not a, a specific consideration of a specific use of the will to form judgments. And the reason is because Spinoza is going to prove that the, um, uh, I mean, that is, he's already proved long before that corollary to Proposition 46 at the end of part two, but um, but from from our point of view, he's going to prove that um, um, modes of thought don't cause modes of extension, or vice versa. Um, yes, Amy. In your uh, drawing, um, yes. I'm a little confused. <laughs> like what the uh, what the dotted circle is? Is that the idea of Bucephalus, or is that like our perception of the idea of Bucephalus? <laughs> that dotted circle was supposed to be, I don't know, I maybe mean, should have drawn it like this. Oh. It really should have been a dotted, dotted Bucephalus. Right? That, that's supposed to represent Bucephalus' yeah. objective reality in the idea. And then that aligns with the formal reality of... Well, so uh, so in the Descartes picture, Bucephalus can have objective reality in the idea, but 
uh, I mean, of course, Bucephalus really doesn't exist now, but did exist. But I mean, it could be, this could be the idea of a unicorn, right? And so like the unicorn has objective reality in my idea of a unicorn, but it doesn't have formal reality. There aren't, aren't really any unicorns. Sorry if I'm just breaking that news to you. <laughs> um, so there aren't really any unicorns. So, um, you know, so, but Descartes says, that's fine as far as it goes, right? I mean, there's no problem with me like thinking about something that doesn't exist. That's not an error. It's only an error if I affirm that it exists. So, you know, so in the Descartes picture, I drew the will here and I was, you know, the will does this act of affirmation. And somehow that's what makes the idea claim that, that there really is a unicorn. But a unicorn has formal reality outside the mind. Oops, I keep forgetting that that place is, that you can't see is there. It's kind of more like a rhinoceros. Um, so, uh, so it, does that make it clear what those dots are and whatever? Or yes. So? Okay. Um, right. So what I was going to say is, um, oh, so uh, Spinoza is going to prove that um, modes of thought don't cause modes of extension and vice versa. Right, because every mode of thought, uh, the conception of that mode only involves the conception of other modes of thought and of the attribute of thought itself. Um, right, because the attribute of every, remember, every attribute completely expresses the divine essence. So there isn't anything else you need to understand a mode of thought besides the attribute of thought and its other modes. And therefore, by axiom four of part one, uh, it's it's all its causes are modes of thought. So a mode of extension can't be a cause of mode of thought or vice versa. Um, that part is going to continue in Leibniz. So that's that's important. Um, uh, so um, and and in a way, although in another way it's completely different. In a way, Spinoza is also going to continue what. I mean, Leibniz is also continuing what Spinoza says about this, which is that nevertheless, there's complete parallelism between what happens in the mode of thought and the mode of body, right? Remember, that's from Proposition 7 of Part 2. The order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. So, um, so like, at the same time I move my hand, there's going to be an affirmation in my mind that my hand moves. And that affirmation doesn't cause my hand to move, because what causes my hand to move is, you know, like muscles and whatever, right? Modes of extension. But that affirmation necessarily goes along with my hand moving. It even, as he suggests in the corollary to Proposition 7 of Part 2, in some way is the same thing as the hand moving only regarded as thought rather than extension, whatever that means exactly. So um, they go together, but one doesn't cause the other. And so like um, everything we call will, you know, like I kind of think of my hand as moving and it moves. I mean, we tend to think that the thought comes first and then the motion, but um, I guess Spinoza is just denying thought and emotion come at the same time. And that's what we call will, willing the hand to move and having it move. So therefore, like every act of the will is an act of affirmation of an idea. There aren't any other acts of the will. Is willing your hand to move is really just having a really strong opinion that it moves. <laughs> Yeah.
Yes, I do. Using this like same kind of, I guess, diagram, would the Spinoza version of this be like the same thing, except the unicorn wouldn't be dotted when it's in the idea because it actually existed? Which well, I mean, the unicorn still is dotted when it's in the idea, right? That is, I mean, and this, again, is something a little weird about the attribute of thought. The attribute of thought seems to have something that the other attributes, but we only know one other example, <laughs> right? So the only other example we know is extension. But the other attributes don't seem to have this, like, property of that their modes have objects. So that seems to create a, a kind of an asymmetry between thought and extension, which is in tension with what he says in the corollary to Proposition 7, where he says they're really the same thing looked at from two points of view, right? That is the... The unicorn, and of course, here by the unicorn, I mean the unicorn's body. <laughs> the unicorn exists objectively in the idea of the unicorn, but the idea of the unicorn doesn't exist objectively in the unicorn. That seems to be an asymmetry. But nevertheless, that is what Spinoza says, it, it seems. So there still is a dotted unicorn. I mean, how we should think, Spinoza himself used the example of a, of a uh, winged horse, right? So, I mean, it was not that far from the unicorn example. He doesn't say enough about it. I, I'm, I'm a little confused how to correctly describe what's going on when I imagine a unicorn, according to Spinoza. Um, um uh i don't know whether it's clear that i'm imagining a possible body which therefore exists at some time or whether the the fact that it, this idea is in me is imagination and therefore as hopefully we'll get to talk about is fragmentary and confused um, is enough to show that the actual object of the idea might in some way be really different from what I'm imagining. Um, um, but yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm confused about how to explain that. So I, uh, so Bernardo said, so our idea of the unicorn differs from the reality of the Oh, no, for, oh, I, first, Jonathan said, but is the idea having an object? Isn't it just the mode being considered now under the attribute of thought, now under extension? Well, no, again, it doesn't seem to be because, because Spinoza doesn't say that, that extended things like are the extended things of ideas that they have objects that relationship of being the same thing looked at from two different points of view would be completely symmetrical i mean furthermore if like so this is my finite human intellect but in the divine intellect, so wait a second. This is in the attribute of extension. This is in the attribute of thought. Right? So in my finite human intellect, because all it is is the idea of a certain body, every idea it contains is the is also the idea of a mode of extension. So like I can't um I don't so much as think of um, um, a mode of any other attribute, except the attribute of thought itself, which is a little complicated. Hopefully we'll get to that. But like, suppose there's another attribute, right? Something 
We don't know what it is. We'll never know what it is. And now you can see why we can't know what it is because again, our mind is the idea of a mode of extension. Um, but presumably in the divine intellect, there's also ideas of these Q things. Um, and then this is weird because we said that every idea, that every body corresponds to an idea because ideas and bodies are just the same thing looked at from two different points of view. But now, like, so you can look at this idea from the point of view of a Q thing. We can look at it from the point of view of an idea. Why can't we also look at it from the point of view of a body? In other words, I get this, this relationship of being this like the same thing at the same time seems to rule out that there are ideas in the divine intellect specifically of modes of extension and others that are modes of some other attribute. I'm sorry, if you didn't follow all of that, it's okay. Um, um, because it's really, I mean, so like, first of all, I'm not the only one who noticed this problem in Spinoza. As I think, as I mentioned before, some people, I think this this view is even kind of popular right now, think that really Spinoza thinks there's only two attributes. That would solve that part of the problem anyway. It still wouldn't get rid of this asymmetry. Um, uh, but that seems really hard to reconcile with the text. So, but I'm not sure what, what better thing to put instead. So I guess just forget about that problem. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, I mean, you, you could, or not as, as strongly raise a problem like this for, uh, Descartes as well. I mean, for Descartes, it's not really a contradiction, but it's still, you could ask, so how do we know that the only types of finite substance are our minds and bodies? Maybe there's some other kind. Um, and uh, I mentioned that because we'll see, I think if you at least, I hope I'll get a chance to talk about this, but if I don't, if you pay attention, you'll see that in Leibniz, this problem goes away. There isn't room for, for some other attribute, so to speak. The way Leibniz explains the relationship between mind and body, first of all, that the asymmetry is, is built into it. And furthermore, it's just uh, like body is um, going to turn out to be nothing but the way minds appear to other minds in a confused fashion. So there isn't, there's only one way that happens. There isn't room for another, actually. Okay, sorry, that was a uh, digression. Now I only have 10 minutes left, but I think I will be able to get to the important part, at least. Um, Okay, so I mean, so this is fine as far as I mean, okay, Descartes and, and Leibniz disagree. I mean, Descartes and, and Spinoza disagree. Spinoza thinks will is identical to intellect, but not only does it rule out Descartes' solution to the problem of how error is possible, it um, it seems to rule out any solution <laughs> because. We're saying that every idea um, is the idea of some conceivable thing, and every conceivable thing actually exists. And having the idea is affirming that its object exists, and its object does exist. So what you affirm is always true.
Um, <laughs> what is a false idea? I mean, first of all, I guess I should emphasize, like, so uh, again, according to Descartes, ideas themselves can't be true or false. It's only judgments, which are affirmations or denials of ideas that can be true or false. But um, but because although Descartes does say there's a kind of secondary sense in which you can call an idea false if its object doesn't have formal reality, right? So you could say the idea of a unicorn is false in the sense that it doesn't correspond to anything that's actually out there. But that's a loose way of talking according to Descartes. But um, but according to Spinoza, uh, ideas are exactly what can be true or false, except they can only be true, it seems like. How can they be false? Um, right, so Josephine says exactly what I'm about to try to explain. <laughs> ideas are true in the totality of God, but not in reference to a specific mode. Or actually, you can use reference on both sides, right? When referred to, it's a little bit confusing because nowadays, and I guess following Kant's use of the verb Bitsian is what's behind this somehow, but we tend to use reference to mean this relation between the idea and its object. But Spinoza is talking about referring an idea to a certain refer and relate basically used to mean the same thing. So you could say relating it to, when, when it's related or referred to the divine intellect as a whole, it's true. Whereas when it's referred to or related to a, a particular finite intellect that contains it, it may be false. But, okay, I want to get there in, in two steps. So the, the first step is that um, um, like what Spinoza actually proves is not that every, not directly that every idea is true, but rather that every adequate idea is true. So this is part two proposition 32. Yeah, actually, it's, so it's part two, proposition 34. Um, Every idea which in us is absolute, that is adequate and perfect, is true. And if we go back to definition four at the beginning of part two, By an adequate idea, I mean an idea which, insofar as it is considered in itself without relation to its object, has all the properties, that is, intrinsic characteristics of a true idea. So this is, again, this is another example of him setting up at the beginning where you think there's going to be a certain distinction, but in the end he proves there isn't. <laughs> right? Like so definition four distinguishes between an adequate idea and a true idea. But by the time we get to proposition 32, we see that every adequate idea is true. But so what the distinction, what where you're supposed to think the distinction is, is again, like if we go back to what Descartes thinks, he can say, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with this idea of a unicorn. It's a perfectly good idea. It's self-consistent. Um um, but whatever else, if anything else it needs to be adequate, it has, there's nothing wrong with it qua idea. The only thing that's wrong is that there isn't actually a unicorn out here, but that's not a problem with the idea. 
right? Like the idea could remain exactly what it is and a unicorn could come into existence and now it'll be fine. So as so so that's like the kind of thing Spinoza is trying to get at in that definition four, where he says an adequate idea has all the intrinsic characteristics of a good idea. That is all the characteristics which um, um, which would have to be there as long as this idea is there. They don't depend on its relation to something outside of it, like a unicorn. So, but again, so, so Spinoza first shows that every adequate idea is true. I mean, actually, this isn't the order it goes in the text, but it's the order I want to talk about it in. Shows that every adequate idea is true. So what, what's a false idea? So then, according to Spinoza, a false idea has to be an idea that has something intrinsically wrong with it. It's an, a false idea is an inadequate idea. Sometimes he also calls it a fragmentary idea. Right? So now, like, we can understand that if this idea somehow fails to completely have something with objective being in it, because it's missing part of the idea, so to speak. Now it can be false because um, like there isn't something to be affirmed here completely. Or, you could, or again, you could say, going back to proposition 16 of part one, you could say, uh, this isn't one of the conceptions of the infinite intellect. So it isn't one of the things whose object exists. But then it turns out, and this is what Josephine was saying, and um, so uh, you can see this in the proof of Proposition 36. Page 87. Um, right? All ideas are in God. Proposition 15 of part one. Remember, that's the one that says everything is in God. <laughs> so all ideas are in God. And insofar as they are related to God, they are all true. Proposition 32, inadequate. Correlated proposition seven. So that the correlated proposition seven is the thing about um, ideas and their objects being the, the same thing regarded from two different points of view. So one can't exist while the other doesn't. So there are no inadequate or confused ideas, except insofar as they are related to the particular mind of someone. So all I did, so I mean, I don't need the last step because I'm not uh, interested in the actual proposition here, but just in what he says during the proof, right? So it's, so what it turns out that um, there aren't really inadequate ideas all ideas are adequate and therefore all true if you regard them as ideas in the infinite intellect. So if you draw in the rest of the intellect, now the intellect is supposed to be only one infinite mode of the attribute of thought. Although what the other modes are becomes difficult to say by the time you get to the end of part two, because imagination is not a, a, another mode and will is not another mode, They're, right? Imagination, it turns out to be a kind of intellection and, and will and intellect are one and the same. And the same thing is gonna turn out to be true of desire. And so it's like, it's not really clear what the other 
modes of the attribute of thought are, but there are supposed to be other ones besides intellect. But anyway, it, so take the entire infinite intellect and regard this as part of that, then it's adequate and true. But when we regard it as contained in this finite mind, it becomes inadequate. And I see that I'm out of time. <laughs> So unfortunately, since I'm going to have to talk about this next time, uh, I don't. This can't be skipped over. Um, so that's what I'll do, and I'll see you then. Bye.